Hi there. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to beautiful Beaches East York. My name is Mary Margaret McMahon, and I am your local candidate in the upcoming provincial election for the Liberal Party. And I am so pleased to welcome our leader, Stephen Del Duca, here to our beautiful area. He is our um, amazing leader of the Ontario Liberal Party and next Premier of Ontario. Here he is. <laughs> Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am so honored to be here, to be back here in Beaches East York, a community that I've had the chance to visit many, many times uh, over, over my time as a leader and also as an MPP and cabinet minister, and to have the chance to stand alongside such an extraordinary local champion, a Mary Margaret McMahon, someone who has a demonstrated track record of delivering incredible leadership for this community. Now, I can remember my very first conversation with Mary Margaret where she first expressed a desire or an interest in running for the nomination here and how thrilled I was and how thrilled I am because people here in Beaches East York know that Mary Margaret McMahon is someone who will never stop working, working relentlessly for them every single step of the way. She will be a phenomenal champion for Beaches East York at Queen's Park. And today we are here to talk about an issue that is of such importance here in this community and across Ontario. And of course, we're talking about in general, the affordability crisis that people are facing, but in particular, the housing affordability crisis that Ontario finds itself in at this moment. Now, when I think about the future that my own daughters, who are 15 and 11, will have, uh, the fact that it uh, feels like it will be out of reach for them to ever be able to buy or rent a home anywhere close to the neighborhood where they've grown up is something that is deeply discouraging. We feel that in my family. Ontarians feel that right across this province. It's certainly felt here in Beaches East York. People who see under Doug Ford how the price of everything has skyrocketed out of control. Now, four years ago in the last election campaign, Doug Ford stood on the stage during one of the leaders' debates and unprompted to a question, he, was at, he, he unprompted said to the particular individual in the audience that if he was elected premier, he would make it easier and cheaper for people to buy homes. And what have we seen? over the four years that Doug Ford has been Premier. It's gone the other way. The average cost of a home in Ontario under Doug Ford has climbed by half a million dollars. The average cost of a home is now for the first time ever up around, or if not, over $1 million. And of course, if you're a tenant, and I know there are lots of tenants here in this community, Doug Ford made a commitment that he would keep rent control in place. He got elected, and then he chose to abandon tenants and actually side with speculators. Ontario Liberals will reverse that reckless and dangerous uh, and discouraging decision that Doug Ford made around rent control. We will reinstate rent control as I've announced. But we've also, as part of our housing plan, talked about the importance of making sure that we do build 1.5 million new homes in this province over the next 10 years. There are a couple of key features of our housing affordability plan, a plan that has been ranked best or highest, for example, by OREA, the Ontario Real Estate, Real Estate Association, uh, in our plan, for example, we will include the creation of an Ontario Home Building Corporation. The Ontario Home Building Corporation will have the funding and the authority to make sure that underutilized or unused public property, property that you and I already own as taxpayers, as residents in this province, that we actually can develop that kind of property. And one really important feature about what this corporation will be able to do, every single unit of housing that is sold by our new Ontario Home Building Corporation will only be made available to first time home buyers. That is a specific commitment that will help the young families in particular and the young people in particular who are trying to get into the housing market. I mentioned a moment ago uh, that we'll be bringing back real rent control. I can also highlight uh, that we will, be, uh, we will be introducing what we like to call a use it or lose it levy. Now we've heard directly uh, from mayors across Ontario, Ontario's big city mayors. They have said specifically in their documents and conversations with us that there are approximately 250,000 units of housing that have already navigated the municipal approvals process, including in many cases the permitting process, and yet they're not being built. And why aren't they being built? Because speculators are choosing to what's called land bank. They're choosing to sit on those lands rather than start building so they can drive up their own profits. 
when you're in the middle, as we are, of a housing affordability crisis, when so many know that this is out of reach for them, that isn't good enough. That's why in our Ontario Liberal plan, we will make sure that those units that have those kinds of municipal approvals and permitting, uh, permitting approvals, uh, if they're not being built, if those units of housing are not being built, there will be a per unit levy that's charged against that speculator. So they'll either start building or they'll sell it to someone who will actually build. That's 250,000 additional new units of housing uh, across many larger municipalities, across all municipalities in this province to help kickstart this process. I just want to finish up my opening comments before I take questions to say when I think back again to the commitments made by Doug Ford in the last election campaign, it is shocking to me that especially as it relates to dealing with issues of making life easier and more affordable, that he literally abandoned the people in this province who needed help. Now I know Doug Ford likes to pretend like the past couple of years haven't really happened. Watching him campaign stuck in that firmly placed bubble around him where he's afraid to talk to members of the media, afraid to interact with everyday Ontarians. Uh, in looking, frankly, at what he campaigns on and what he talks about, it is so clearly evident that Doug Ford and his team just want to skate by what we've all gone through with COVID over the past couple of years. They just want to kind of skate by the affordability crisis that's making your life so much more difficult. Well, I don't believe that's good enough. Ontario Liberals have a positive, forward-looking and fair plan. It is a fully costed plan. It will deal with the housing affordability crisis. It will make sure units of housing that are approved actually get built. It'll bring back rent control. It'll make sure that first-time homebuyers can break into or crack into the market, the market the way that they should be able to. It will do all of this and more because we are committed to making sure that working together, working with you and for you, that we will, we will guarantee that Ontario is once again a place to grow. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. So we've just got reporters on the ground and also on the line today. So we're gonna start with reporters on the ground and then we'll move over to the line afterwards. I just ask folks to come up to the mic for their questions. All right, good morning, Stephen. Morning. In terms of this 250,000 units number, it's obviously a number that the uh, large urban mayor's caucus yep. and, and other uh, municipal politicians have come up with. Have you subjected it to any kind of scrutiny? Because they have an obvious vested interest in uh, deflecting any responsibility for the current housing crisis from municipal councils and onto alleged uh, land banking speculators. <laughs> well, I mean, so a, a couple of examples I've used, you know, and Mayor Bonnie Crombie, uh, she said to me directly the last time that I met with the Ontario big city mayors, which was a number of weeks ago or days ago, I've lost track of time. Uh, she specified that there are 60,000 units in the city of Mississauga uh, that, uh, that have approvals, that have permit, permits in place. Uh, I've heard it from a number of councillors. And in fact, Jeff Lehman, who is running for me, for us, in Barrie, Springwater, Oro Medante, isn't just the former mayor, I guess, of Barrie. He is also the former chair of Ontario's big city mayors. And he has talked about this. I've heard from the mayor of Aurora. I've heard from mayors across York Region and beyond. Uh, so going forward, whether the number is 250,000, 249,000, 251,000, of course, a, a ministry or a government working with us, working for us, for you, the people of Ontario, yes, of course, we would go through scrutinizing exactly what the number is, but it's about the concept. It's about the concept that we know there are speculators who are land banking to drive up their profits. Here's the other thing that we know, which I didn't mention in my opening, but I will now. We know that Doug Ford, kind of works hand in glove with those speculators. Some of them are his biggest political donors. They are the same people that stand to benefit from a number of the other initiatives that are in Doug Ford's plan, like building highways that don't make sense. And we know they're land banking so they can drive up their profits. When, when families are struggling in this province, you cannot afford to have a premier or a government that is comfortable with that kind of reckless greed. That's why Ontario Liberals have a plan to stop that and to move forward to build what's required. There's nine days left in the campaign, and uh, <laughs> certainly your party is not in first uh, in the polls. Uh, depending on which poll you believe, uh, you might not even be the second party in the legislature when this is all over. No. You ran for the leadership uh, on the, the explicit promise of, uh, that you, know, you had to make Doug Ford a one-term premier, yep. that you would restore the Liberal Party to yep. uh, government. Uh, what are you going to tell your members if, when the <laughs> dust settles uh, on June 2nd, you're not even in contention for government. So first of all, look, Ontario Liberals, me included, Mary Margaret included, we're working relentlessly hard to talk about 
the plan, the very clear plan that we have. It's the team, it's the plan, and most importantly, it's that clear choice. What has emerged over this campaign, remember the earliest stage of the campaign, as Ontario Liberals set the pace and set the agenda, moving into the leaders' debate, coming out of the leaders' debate, there is undeniable momentum that is coalesced around our plan and our team and the message that we're putting forward. We're going to continue to work relentlessly hard over the next nine days. Uh, but this is what it's all about. It is about stopping Doug Ford. It is about having a progressive liberal government at Queen's Park, not because of any kind of scorecard in terms of the politics, but because the people of Beaches East York and the people of Ontario need real progress in this moment. They need a government that has a plan in place that is caring and compassionate. And I will say responsible because our plan is fully costed. That's what the people of this province need right now. They know it. They can feel it. Mary Margaret and I were just talking about how it feels in this community over the last few days as more Ontarians realize that we are getting that much closer to Election Day. They know how high the stakes are. There is a, there is a tangible feeling of excitement and, again, momentum around our candidates. I feel it when I'm traveling around the province. It's exciting. I'm having tons of fun, but I'm never going to stop working. And our team will not stop working until we've made Doug Ford a one-term premier and we've delivered a strong progressive liberal government at Queen's Park. Uh, in the same vein, um, is there an outcome or a scenario uh, come June 2nd <laughs> where you step down as party leader? Whether or not you share that with us, do you have internally some kind of uh, measure for, for what that would be? <laughs> Look, I, again, I'm working relentlessly hard. When I think about what we've managed to accomplish as Ontario Liberals in two years uh, under a pandemic, which has made life so much more difficult for so many Ontarians, uh, we have grown our party membership beyond, uh, beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, we were the first of the three main political parties, uh, NDP, us, and, and the Conservatives, uh, to pay off $10 million in campaign debt from 2018. We have a roster of candidates like Mary Margaret, who are extraordinarily talented, so experienced, dedicated, hardworking, ready to hit the ground running on day one. And we're in the midst of a campaign where people are understanding that they have a stark, clear choice. Four more years of being held down and being pulled back by Doug Ford, who wants to stand with speculators. He wants to stand with the profit makers. We don't. We want to stand with the people. You know, the biggest fraud of the 2018 campaign was Doug Ford traipsing all over Ontario claiming he was for the people. He's not for the people. He's for the profiteers. He's for the big box and giant corporations. We're not. We are legitimately for the people of Ontario. You see that reflected in our plan and how we're working. So over the next nine days, I'm just going to work as hard as I possibly can the way that my parents and grandparents taught me to. Mary Margaret's going to do the same. I know that about her and the rest of our team. We'll let the people of Ontario decide. But I just want to be really clear about this. There is one way and only one way to stop Doug Ford and to make him a one-term premier. And that is, choose, that is by voting for the Ontario Liberal candidate in your riding, for the Ontario Liberal Party because of our plan and our team. We can form and will form a strong progressive Liberal government at Queen's Park and we will make sure that Doug Ford's first term is his last. So uh, Global News reported that your riding association paid for dinners uh, totaling tens of thousands of dollars uh, during your time as an MPP. How do you justify that, given your criticisms of the MPP allowances that PC uh, members have been <laughs> receiving? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, let's be really crystal clear about this. Let's not try to muddy the waters and compare, compare apples to oranges. There was nothing in any of the expenses highlighted in the story that is in any way, shape, or form a top-up for an MPP, unlike what we saw earlier in this campaign from the Conservative Party. I want to be crystal clear about that. Secondly. I will, tell, I will tell you, I will tell anyone, in my time previously as an MPP, I was a very active and very political MPP. For example, 2014, I had the honor of serving as the co-chair of our election platform uh, for, for, the, for uh, the, the, former, uh, the former team. Uh, I was also, for example, the liaison, the caucus liaison for what's known as the Ontario Young Liberals. Uh, and I was, I was active in terms of fundraising both for my riding association and for the central party. In all of that activity, uh, yes, there were times when there were costs, legitimate political expenses that were reimbursed. Uh, that's part of the job of being an MPP. However, I've also said previously in this campaign, I said it months ago, a commitment to a citizen's assembly to strengthen our democracy. Uh, I believe that citizen's assembly, which we will appoint when we form government on June 2nd, should have wide discretion to look at all aspects of our politics and our governing and, and how we deal with elections, including 
strengthening uh, election finances, reforming election finances. To be clear, I want every party involved in that discussion, and I want, of course, Elections Ontario involved in it as well. And I think together, working collaboratively the way the people of Ontario expect us to, we will be able to strengthen political finance, uh, political finance legislation, and our democracy to deliver what the people of Ontario need. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. Hey, Jeff. How are you? I'm great. Um, How are you? I'm okay. Good. Yeah, you're in the neighborhood. Uh, well, we wanted to make so it easy for you today. Easy to get here. Rode the bike. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, so the, there's a story in the Star about this memo, a campaign strategy. Here comes the GO train. I know. Let me know if you can hear me. I love this. Uh, are I you can aiming you. for to, to deny, to, to, to put forward to a minority, or are you aiming to win government here? It seems like the only realistic scenario is knock him down a peg and put him in a minority position. That's where you're, that's where you're targeting. Isn't so it? look, my target is to continue to talk about the positive plan that Ontario Liberals have for people's lives. That's why we're talking about how we will end the reckless, out of control, Ford supported profiteering that we see in the housing market, which has to end. This has to be about real people, not about the greed that Doug Ford wants to enable. That's just not good enough. So we're working hard to talk about the plan. We're not gonna stop until those votes are counted on June 2nd. What I do know, what's emerged in particular since the leaders debate, is there's one clear alternative to Doug Ford. That is a responsible and competent new Ontario Liberal team. That's what we're going to focus on. There is a clear choice on this election campaign. It started early on. It's really emerged since the leaders debate. There is momentum around Mary Margaret McMahon and the rest of our candidates. We're just going to keep working hard until June 2nd and we'll see what the people say. But I know and I'm working hard with Mary Margaret to deliver and elect a strong, liberal, progressive government. Uh, just, and just back to the, the global story, uh, 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 you know, this campaign has a, has a lot of rhetoric about I'm for the little guy, he's for the big bad corporations, uh, but you were for the steakhouses, I and mean, these were fancy restaurants. Do you not see that that is uh, going to be damaging to uh, in a campaign where we're talking about how much everything costs? Uh, and here you were out, you mentioned it's, it's fundraising, it's party events. But these were at uh, these were expensive restaurants. This wasn't. Uh, would it have been wiser to go to Swiss Chalet or something? So look, we're, we're, we're again respectfully. We're kind of talking about apples and oranges. We're we're in a moment now in the aftermath. Almost, let's hope the aftermath of COVID. We know the affordability crisis that's spiraling out of control. And Doug Ford's been premier for four years, and at every single moment and opportunity over four years, sitting in that chair, when he has had a chance to actually make his actions match his empty rhetoric from four years ago, every single time he's chosen to side with big box, with giant corporations, with reckless profiteers, to side with greed every single time, to side with privatizing core public services. Why else would his hand-picked health minister say they're going to clear the surgical backlog by prioritizing private hospitals? Why would private schools be getting rapid tests ahead of our public schools here in beaches and elsewhere? Why would he want to build a highway that's not going to save commuters any time, the 413, but it's actually going to make some of his richest political donors dramatically richer? And why would he have a housing plan that builds nothing in to deliver real affordability, simply to build, you know, at market or above market and do nothing to deal with the land banking crisis or issue? So this is my point. You, you look at the track record, you look at what Doug Ford has focused on, who he's delivered for, over the past four years when he's been in that chair and he has made it crystal clear whose side he's on and that's why i said just a moment ago the biggest fraud of the 2018 campaign was doug ford claiming he was for the people he's not for the people he's for privatization he is for reckless cuts he's for the profit makers it's not good enough especially given where we find ourselves right now can i just zero in on that private hospitals comment this yeah. has been going around making the rounds a lot do you have any evidence that they're actually changing the rules or prioritizing private hospitals other than an out of context quote from minister elliott from however many months ago it was well i mean you say out of context but she literally said i mean i've watched the clip myself she said i think it was around the third week of february of this year in the aftermath of in the after i love the go trains it's always a thrill for me to see them go by uh in the aftermath of the omicron challenge that we faced when we knew that we had a massive surgical and diagnostic backlog that was growing, it's at a million, roughly a million people in this province who are waiting for surgery or diagnosis, Christine Elliott chose to say that they would be prioritizing private hospitals. Now, when you look at how they've dealt with so much else, uh, how they've dealt with some of the P PCR testing, how they've dealt with what I talked about a second ago when it comes to uh, the rapid tests in public versus private schools, 
and how Doug Ford supports his biggest and richest political donors, big box retail, giant corporations. The track record is right there for anyone to see. The reason Doug Ford is stuck in a bubble, the reason he's afraid to take questions from you and your colleagues, the reason he's afraid to talk to the people of Ontario, or by the way, release his mandate letters from four years ago, is because he knows what he wants to do. He wants to destroy the core public services that are the foundation of everything we stand on in this province. He wants to privatize. So he doesn't want to come out of the bubble. He doesn't want to have to admit that he is determined to take a wrecking ball to everything Ontarians hold dear. We're not going to let him. That's why Ontario Liberals are working as hard as we possibly can to make sure people understand, and they do. There's a clear choice. Doug Ford's privatization, his cuts and his chaos dragging us down, or a clear Ontario Liberal progressive alternative to build this province up and make it a place to grow. Last question, real quick. No Why are we here? Is this is this a land bank uh, situation behind us here? This lovely uh, architectural marvel, or or what's what's the reason? This is an example of what you're talking about. So we see in this we see in this neighborhood examples, and I didn't mention this in my opening remarks, but I will now. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, when I think about the Ontario Home Building Corporation, one of the things that we stressed in our housing plan was that as taxpayers, as people in this province, we together, we own thousands of acres of underused or underutilized land. So imagine a world where we're in a public, or, sorry, we're in a housing affordability crisis. There are tens of thousands of acres that you and I already own. So those, the land costs as an input cost, they're already baked in because we own the land. And yet there are some public agencies that are out there on the market trying to sell properties like one of the ones that I'm standing in front of right now. In this case, I'm talking about Metrolinks. And it's, it's out there and it's for sale. And there's nothing specified in there about how this is going to make it more affordable. So again, I'm not, the system is as it is right now. That's why we need reform. That's why we need a real plan. That's why we will create an Ontario home building corporation that will have the authority and the funding in place to make sure that underutilized or unused public land is actually developed and converted into affordable housing. And again, let me just stress, if you're a first time home buyer in this province, if you're looking for your first opportunity to get into the housing ownership market, our Ontario Home Building Corporation will only sell what we build to you. Everything we build, everything we sell, I should say, will only be made available to first time home buyers. Doug Ford has nothing. Four years as the cost of housing has skyrocketed and there's nothing anywhere in his plan that specifically targets or helps first time home buyers. You know who it helps? It helps the land bankers, it helps the speculators, it helps his political donors, it helps the profiteers. Biggest fraud of the 2018 campaign. Hi Stephen, Nusheen Ziafati, uh, Canadian Press. Hi there. Uh, in light of the storm this past weekend, will you commit to have specific funding for municipalities to improve their infrastructure for climate uh, mitigation and adaptation? Is that part of your party's platform? It, it is, it is. Now, forgive me for not remembering the exact dollar figure. I think it's $300 million, but we'll get that to you that we specifically set aside on our sustainability plan to deal with climate resilience, to support conservation authorities or municipalities or both to help deal with exactly uh, what we've seen. I'll just point out, when I was in Clarence Rockland yesterday, uh, the only political leader, well, at least Doug Ford went to Uxbridge, I think, later in the day, kind of under the cover of being stuck in that bubble that he doesn't want anyone to break through. Uh, when I was in Clarence Rockland yesterday, what the mayor said to me was, this is the third, if I'm not mistaken, the third natural disaster in five years. You know, Doug Ford likes to talk about these things like they're the once-in-a-lifetime storms. You know what that tells me? That tells me that Doug Ford is, in essence, a climate change denier. A climate change denier. Because my younger daughter, who's 11, not yet a teenager, has seen more once-in-a-lifetime storms in her short life than my father did in his entire life, or has in his entire life. So when Doug Ford, sort of in a blasé way, talks about these things like they're once-in-a-lifetime, they're not. They're not for families in Uxbridge or for families in Clarence Rockland. He just doesn't get it because he is a climate change denier. If elected, will you offer any financial assistance to those who have seen major property damage? And if so, how much would you offer or do you think the province should offer, offer after damaging storms like this one? Do you mean, for, for example, homeowners, residences? Yes. You know, what I heard yesterday from, from every homeowner that I had the chance to speak to in Hammond was that they, are, they, they already have some of the insurance companies. Most, most, if not all, have home insurance, property insurance. Uh, they've already been in touch with their insurance, uh, their insurance providers, like we actually saw. And I heard from Amanda Samard about insurance, uh, I guess, adjusters or staff being in uh, the affected communities. 
Uh, we would want to make sure that the insurance industry is living up to its obligations. Uh, and we, you know, again, open to the conversation because we now know, well, not now know, we know, we've known for a long time that this, these are, these are, <laughs> these freak storms are no longer occasional. They're no longer once in a lifetime or once in a generation. They're happening all the time. The tornadoes, floods, forest fires, all of it. You know, uh, it's just to think that in this day and age, there is a person who is currently in the premier's chair who doesn't want to believe in the science, who wants to deny that it's real, who doesn't want to show up, only showed up after they saw that I went out to Clarence Rockland and did the job that a premier is supposed to do, the job that Doug Ford doesn't have the capacity to do, and he makes that more clear every single day. Uh, you know, it's just shocking to me that he's still, he's stuck in the political bubble and he's stuck in a science and reality bubble because he just doesn't understand what's happening right now and he doesn't want to believe that it's true. Liberals are different. We have that positive plan. It's forward looking. It is fair. It is fully costed. And we will move to make sure that on greenhouse gas emissions, we are net zero by 2050. We'll make sure that we have a real plan to make life better, more affordable and more sustainable for Ontarians here in Beaches East York and elsewhere. OK, so I think that's everyone on the ground. We just have a couple of minutes, so we'll take a couple of questions from the line. Over to you, Will. OK, just a reminder to reporters on the line, if you could raise your hand using the Zoom function, I will add you to the queue for a question. Your first question is Chris Rochoe from the Toronto Star. Go ahead, Chris. Hi there. Thanks for hey, taking Chris. my question. My pleasure. Um, thank you. Uh, Doug Ford was out on the weekend, and he was door knocking, and he was actually in Vaughn Woodbridge. He and was. I'm just wondering yeah. what you make of that. How do you feel about that? You know, I don't think it's about what I feel about it. I think of the families that I saw in Hammond uh, yesterday in, uh, in Clarence Rockland and in, in surrounding areas. I think about the families who literally, I mean, we saw the roof of a nearby Rona, a massive aluminum or metal red roof that had torn off that building and had flown over a couple of streets of residential homes and it had landed on other homes. I mean, the pictures are startling. They're startling. Let me say the families that I, I spoke with are in remarkable, they have remarkable resilience and strength. They are working together to help make sure that they can get their generators running, that I saw one plumber who lived down the street from his neighbors, he came over to help them connect their sump pump. I mean, that's, that is the Ontario way. But just imagine for a moment that while that was happening to families in Clarence Rockland and Uxbridge and other parts of this province, I think 10, at last count, 10 Ontarians tragically lost their lives as a result of the storm. Again, my condolences go out to their families. Just imagine where Doug Ford was in the midst of all that, in the midst of that struggle that people in his province are facing. Doug Ford chose to engage in political gimmickry by heading into my riding to knock on a door or two. I chose instead to go out to the affected area. I'm not running to be a gimmick driven politician. I'm running to be premier of this province and a premier historically liberal, conservative, even NDP. Every other premier in our history has understood that there is a fundamental obligation to show up when the chips are down and the stakes are high. One premier in our history, certainly in our modern history, who just doesn't get it. And that's Doug Ford. He didn't go to Ottawa in the midst of the illegal occupation. He chose to go snowmobiling at his cottage instead. He didn't show up to Clarence Rockland or any other community on Sunday. He chose for a photo op to go and knock on a door or two in my riding. That tells you all you need to know about how Doug Ford is simply not capable or qualified to do the job of leading Ontario. Thank you, yes, and I'm just wondering if you have any concerns about winning your seat and are we gonna see, do you need to spend more time in your riding over the next nine days? Look, I, I, we, I learned in life a long time ago, you never take anything for granted. You've all heard me say repeatedly, it's about, it's about hard work. There is no shortcut to success. I love the community that my wife and I have chosen to raise our young daughters in. I've lived in Bonn for more than 30 years now. My kids go to neighborhood schools. I shop at the local Fortinos at Highway 7 and Weston Road. Anybody wants to join me, I'll be there next Saturday at 7 o'clock in the morning when it opens. I'll show you where all the good deals are. Uh, I know the community. I love the community. I was so proud to be part of a government that delivered the funding for Vaughn's Hospital, for the 10-bed residential hospice, six new schools, the 427 extension. Uh, so. I, didn't, I don't take anything for granted, but I feel really good about the feedback that we've been getting. My wife and daughters have been out knocking on doors, even my dad. My older brother took my dad out yesterday and they went knocking on doors and they had a blast. So I'm feeling good about it, but we take nothing for granted. We'll just keep working hard. 
and I'm looking to once again have the honor of representing Vaughn Woodbridge at the legislature and being their local champion. Okay, your next question is from Alan Hale from Queens Park Today. Go ahead, Alan. Hi, Stephen. I see that the party has just put out a press release about uh, anti-Semitism, accusations of anti-Semitism among the NDP. Yeah. Uh, a lot of this is seems to be uh, criticisms of support for uh, the BDS movement or for uh, joining Facebook uh, groups criticizing uh, Israel's policy towards the Palestinians. So I guess my question is what, if this is, uh, do you believe that uh, supporting the Palestinians or the BDS movement or criticizing Israel's policy towards them is anti-Semitism? So first of all, let me just say really clearly and unequivocally here in the Ontario that I believe in, that we believe in, that we're fighting to, uh, to create, to maintain, there is no place for intolerance, for hatefulness, for discrimination. There's no place for anti-Semitism. There's no place for Islamophobia. None of those, none of those, um, none of those disturbing, inappropriate, uh, irresponsible behaviors is acceptable at any point in time. I think what the most recent uh, set of stories that have, have emerged about the Ontario NDP, I think they shine a light on a disturbing pattern. You know, I think back to Andrea Horvath's star candidate and Ajax, Steve Parrish, uh, who uh, it was, uh, it was uh, made evident months ago that uh, both as mayor and then after being mayor, uh, he had chosen to support a move that was actually going to be honoring someone who served as a Nazi soldier during the Second World War. And he didn't want to change his approach on this after becoming a star candidate for Andrea Horvath and the Ontario NDP. And she stood with him for weeks, for weeks, she let that just kind of continue to be out there as more stories emerged about how disturbing it is uh, or was to have that kind of candidate. And by the way, not just any candidate, someone she stood with, stood beside, bragged about uh, as the big star catch for Ajax. And to me, again, this is part of a larger pattern of disturbing behavior uh, within, within their ranks. And I think it's important for leaders to call all of it out. So whether it's anti-Semitism or it's Islamophobia, or any other form of intolerance or hate or discrimination, it does not belong in our modern political discourse. It needs to be called out at all times. And I think if you are a, a frankly, a, uh, a Jewish Ontarian, I think you must have a lot of questions this morning. If you live in Toronto, St. Paul's, you, have a lot, you must have a lot of questions about your current NDP member. If you live in some of the other affected ridings, you must have questions. It must be deeply discouraging because you must by now be able to see because of this disturbing pattern uh, that you don't have a place in the Ontario NDP. And I just, again, I don't, I don't think that's good enough. I think at every turn, whether it's anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or any other form of intolerance, leaders have a responsibility to lead and the NDP have now dropped the ball on this. I still would like to hear, do you believe that supporting the BDS movement or criticizing uh, Israel as an apartheid state is anti-Semitic? I believe that when you don't call out uh, the behavior that we've seen, when you don't stand up strongly, when you continue to have this disturbing pattern emerge, I mean, I, can't, I cannot possibly think of any reasonable or valid excuse for Andrea Horvath to have stood by her former candidate in Ajax for weeks and weeks as she was being asked directly by many, by many reporters, why are you standing with someone who chose to honor a former Nazi soldier in the Second World War when community groups were calling them out for it? Stood by him day after day, week after week, week after week. And then suddenly, when the pressure became too difficult to bear, uh, suddenly he was no longer the candidate. I, I just think that's, to me, that's not, that's not what we need in this province right now, especially given how we've seen a, a, a sharp rise in Islamophobia, in anti-Semitism, in hate online. It's just not good enough anymore to try to sweep this stuff under the rug. You have to be strong on it. You have to be clear on it. You have to call it out. And again, it's a disturbing pattern, and I think it's deeply disappointing. Okay, and that was your last question. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.